Hi everyone, did you hear me? Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I hope we can start. Welcome everyone to this um, fourth session of the Africa Climate and Health Responder course. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of the team supporting the development of this climate and health responder coup, and very happy to moderate this, today's session. I'm Dr. Sohna Cham. I'm an environmental epidemiologist and currently an associate research scientist at the African Population and Health Research Center, based at the West Africa Regional Office in Dakar, Senegal. I led the Climate, Environment, and Health Research Unit at the West Africa Regional Office. Uh, for people who may not maybe know EPHRC, EPHRC is the first research to policy institution generating evidence, strengthening research and related capacity in the African research and development ecosystem, and engaging policy to inform action on health and development. The center is Africa best and African led, with its headquarter in Nairobi, Kenya, and West Africa Regional Office, Waro, in Dakar, Senegal. IPHRC seek to drive change by developing strong African research leadership and promoting evidence informed decision making across Sub Saharan Africa. I wanted just to introduce myself quickly. And I'm very, very honored to be part of the team supporting the development and this course. And thanks again to the Columbia team for the opportunity. Once again, welcome everyone. And thanks for registering to this exciting course. Oh, we just, just please be reminded that we have simultaneous interpretation in French, in English and Portuguese. And for those who would like to use the interpretation, please click on the interpretation icon, highlight it in yellow and select your preferred or most appropriate language. Uh, okay, for the course we have, let me do this. For the course, we have uh, five uh, 11 sessions that is running from, we have 11 sessions that is running every Tuesday and Thursday from 17 October, September to 22nd October. And today we have our fourth session on heat related illness and mortality. And the next session will be on October 1st on degraded air quality. We have also some logistic uh, aspect we would like to, to share with you. Today we have 90 minute session as the previous one. And the course will end with a q and a section. If you have questions for the presenter, please use this, uh, uh, the q and a feature to, for your question. The session are being as all material for this session uh, will be made available on the course website. Today we have uh, five course learning objectives. And the first one is to identify current and projected change to temperature and risk of extreme heat event in Africa. The second one is to define heat sensitive health condition and cite example of way in which heat impacts the uh, pathophysiology of cardiovascular, renal, respiratory, neurologic, and maternal disease. The third one is to identify medical diagnosis, medication, and other health determinants that makes patients more vulnerable to climate-related treats and steps that health professionals can take counsel individuals to reduce risk. The fourth one is to explain how extreme heat may exacerbate mental health burden in Africa. And the last one is to explore the role of early warming system and other measures that can help prevent adverse health outcome. 
Today we will be having three speakers. The first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Adeline Luzambili, who is a research scientist with extensive experience across Africa and the UK. Dr. Luzambili is uh, focusing in her research on critical issues such as maternal and neonatal health, climate change, aging, environmental sanitation and water. She is currently the principal investigator of the Heart Project in Kenya, funded by the UK Medical Research Foundation. She's also led investigation on the impact of heat exposure on maternal and neonatal health and the implementation of behavior change intervention to mitigate heat-related risk at the Kenyan field site for the Shapna Consortium through the Hagarian Han University. Dr. Lusambili will give us a 40-minute full lecture on today's topic. Her presentation will be followed by a, present, a case study presentation by Dr. Khadija Tu Kajo, who was supposed to present you with Dr. Adam Masana, who we will miss today. So Dr. Kajo will give us a 20-minute case study. Dr. Kajo is a social scientist à l'Institut de recherche en santé, euh, en sciences de la santé du Centre national de la recherche scientifique et technologique in Ouagadougou. So, Dr. Kadio. Recherche interest include police, social policy, <laughs> health policy and system, equity, community empowerment and climate change. She has experience in participatory research approach and has carried out extensive field work for research on maternal and child health, and also has participated in several milk country study as principal investigator or coins investigator and collaborated with various research in and outside Africa. I think after this uh, presentation of this brilliant researcher, we would like just to remind you how evaluation for this course. As we continue to improve our training and learning program, your feedback is really invaluable to us. A survey link will be shared at the end of the session in the chat, and we highly encourage you to share your true and suggestion. Your input will help us to tailor next session to better meet your needs and expectations. With this, I will hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Lou Sambili. Over to you, the floor is yours. Let me stop my screen share. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from the way, from wherever you've logged in. Welcome to this very exciting uh, session. Uh, we'll be talking about heat-related illness and mortality. Uh, Okay, so um, so in today's presentation, I will explore the current and projected temperature changes in Africa and examine the impact of extreme heat on vulnerable groups. I will also define health sensitive health conditions, heat, heat sensitive health conditions, and discuss strategies to reduce heat related risks, including the role of early warning systems. I will also I also plan to highlight how extreme heat, including the role of early, uh, how extreme heat worsens mental health, and how early heat warnings can help 
prevent heat related health issues. So those are my objectives uh, for today. So what do we know about climate change in Africa and this projection? So we have evidence that the current uh, temperatures in Africa will rise over three degrees centigrade by the end of the century with a five to 10 fold increase in extreme heat days by the turn of the century. And as we know, temperatures have already increased by 0 0.7 degrees centigrade to one across the African continent. And with compelling evidence that the regions like the Sahel and Northern Africa are warming faster than the global average. However, what we also know is that there is significant regional variation, especially with South Africa experiencing strong seasonal warming while Central Africa has warmed uh, the least. So that's the evidence we have. And what we know statistically, um, as you can see, uh, rising temperatures are a concern as uh, by the words from the United Nations Secretary General that say that Earth is becoming hotter and more dangerous for everyone everywhere. And it has deleterious impact on the health of the population. In the UK, for instance, uh, in 2023, the Health Security Agency reported that 2295 deaths were linked to rising temperatures, while Europe saw 61,672 staggering deaths due to the summer of heat of 2022. But what we know is that the situation is different in Africa because we don't have routine data collected, but we have ports of data. For instance, we have data showing that between 2011 and 2020, up to 19,000 children died from heat-related causes, with half of these deaths attributed to climate change. But South Africa is actually experienced uh, rising temperatures and statistics showed that in 19, between 1997 to 2013, 3.4% of all deaths were linked to rising uh, temperatures. So what is the future like, as you can see from the diagram, from the figure on the left, temperatures have been rising and they continue to rise due to human-induced warming. And depending on human activities, Africa's average temperature will increase by 1.5 degrees centigrade to three by 2050. Northern Africa could experience up to five degrees rise by the end of the century if and only if emissions continue at the current rate. And we also have evidence that heat waves will become longer and more intense and extreme weather events, including tropical storms, will be more uh, likely to increase, to increase across the continent. So for Africa, let's just even take the example of East Africa, the impact of rising temperatures. The harsh reality of global warming, actually, you can see how it has impacted East Africa. For instance, from 2020 to 2023, uh, we, uh, East Africa experienced five relentless dry seasons that would left 23.4 million people food insecure, forcing 2.7 million from their homes. And we also have evidence that in 2010 to 50,000 Somalis died in a famine. And soon after, and during that severe drought class displaced around 700,000 more. And this has been uh, an issue in the East and Horn of Africa. That's just a case study. But these extreme events actually highlight and continue to highlight the risks of heat-related mortality and other health issues, including displacement and reduced agricultural uh, productivity. So um, looking at the risks, the extreme uh, weather has multiple risks. As you can see, I've tried to map some of them in the screen. Um, extreme heat poses uh, risks such as deaths uh, in vulnerable groups, 
can lead to wildfires and air pollution episodes such as ozone and smog. Then they can impact critical services like transport and IT infrastructure. And alongside, they can also have a negative impact on power outages and they can impact on nuclear power generation. Other risks may include habitat species decline and reduced water quality in many places in Africa is due to lower uh, river flows. So in the next slide, we'll look at who is vulnerable uh, and what are the vulnerability factors. So um, I have mapped um, uh, the key heat vulnerability factors uh, that increase health risks during heat events, and they include both physiological and exposure factors. So the physiological factors involve individuals with medical conditions, uh, vulnerable groups like pregnant people, pregnant women, infants, and while exposure factors may cover outdoor workers, for instance, people working in the farms or in poor housing, people experiencing homelessness, and those who are working outside in the heat. So together, the, both the exposure factors and the physiological factors, when they intersect, they heighten uh, the vulnerabilities and the risk of heat-related health issues, as you can clearly see on the screen. So I move on to heat sensitive conditions. What are they? I define heat sensitive health conditions as medical issues triggered or worsened by exposure to extreme heat. So we know rising temperatures in heat waves may increase the risk of conditions such as heat stroke, dehydration, and other complications. And also we have evidence that warmer climates may also expand the habitat for disease carrying insects like mosquitoes while increasing the spread of other vector borne diseases. And so slide 10, we talk about the health outcomes which I've tried to summarize. We see heat outcomes may include severe health impacts such as heat injuries and heat related mortality. This can also lead to indirect deaths where heat worsens other conditions like heart attacks and strokes resulting or may result in emergency hospital admissions. Heat may also affect the overall well being, including cognitive function and thermal comfort. So there was a study done in Central America where researchers found that um, there was a traumatic increase in chronic kidney disease of a known origin, um, particularly among adult male agricultural workers, especially those in the sugar cane industry. However, this rise is unexplained by conventional risk factors like hypertension and diabetes, suggesting that other environmental or occupational factors may actually be involved. And we have other studies that have shown that chronic, chronic kidney disease is likely to increase. I mean, where workers are outdoor, especially male adult workers. So in the figure below, I've tried to map the impacts of heat on children at different uh, life stages. And this is some of it has come through some research that I will share later in a video. Uh, so during conception, high temperatures may increase the risk of hypertensive disorders and preeclampsia leading to preterm birth. For the in for the fetal stage, heat is associated with low birth weight, still birth, and congenital abnormalities. There's this compelling research that shows that in newborns, heat affects infant care and breastfeeding while increasing the risk of heat stress, morbidity, and mortality. And for infants, heat may contribute to heat related mortality and may also exacerbate existing health conditions. 
So this, um, <clears throat> the, the figure of the screen is taken from a study that was conducted by one of my, one of our colleagues, Dr. Sherry Pat, uh, from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the study was conducted in Burkina Faso to map the heat impact on breastfeeding. So she found that uh, uh, breastfeeding duration decreases by 2.3 minutes per day for every increase, for every one decrease increase in temperature. So this results in a 23, as you can see on the screen, this results in a 23 minute reduction in daily breastfeeding during the hottest times of the year compared to cooler months. So in a nutshell, what we are trying to say that heat is likely to impact uh, breastfeeding the time spent breastfeeding, and also is likely to impact uh, behaviors around breastfeeding. So heat has impact on mental health for all ages. It can disrupt sleep, it can cause irritability when it's too hot, and it impacts development in newborns. Uh, in, in learners, heat has been this evidence to show that heat reduces focus, it can increase stress and it can affect learning. And for, um, for, for those that are living with dementia, it is likely to worsen their anxiety and increase isolation uh, in this population. And for this also association of anxiety uh, in postpartum women, anxiety and depression, plus emo uh, emotional exhaustion in new mothers. So in one of our studies we did, uh, uh, which I will share later on, heat, height, and stress, anxiety, and physical discomfort in pregnant women uh, leading to mental health. And they are amplifying factors that reinforce each other. For instance, mental health may be caused by factors like its impacts on water sources, its impact on food production, income, and generally productivity in their homes. So I would like to share a video uh, through uh, which we did through the climate heat and maternal and neonatal health in Africa study, which was the first consortium to map out the impact of heat uh, on maternal and newborn and newborns uh, in, in, in Africa. But this video was taken in Kenya, and uh, this is a, was an ethnography where women were reporting how heat is impacting them uh, on their health and the health of their newborn. So we'll watch this and then we continue. Kulialia kwa sababu hile joto, siku. Na kwa shido, na kaa sasa unaanza kumweka awe comfort hata kwa na hile. Ye yuko na stress, wepi yuko na stress, usungizu, uko na halali. In Kenya, Kilifi County is a largely rural coastal area that experiences temperatures of 100 degrees and no less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Climate, heat and maternal neonatal health Africa conducted research to understand the effect of heat exposure on women during pregnancy, postpartum and on their neonates. Maternal exposure to heat leads to exhaustion. Ni kama kilomita hii nepaka kwa muto. Asubui ni meenda safari tatu. Ni kazi nyingi za nyumba zime nishinda kufani. Mothers, they do not prefer to come for postnatal care because of the long distance and hot weather and most of the babies do not get their first shot. C-sections have really increased and low birth weight babies. Women and neonates experience discomfort and exclusive breastfeeding is not possible. Babies are born with blisters on the skin and in their mouth, making it difficult to breastfeed and care for them. Matiti alikuwa na sweat, na matiti yangu alikuwa mefura. Lack of greening around the homes and health facilities amplifies women's experience 
of heat exposure. Kita nye na changia sana huku mazingira huku kwa sababu nyumba zina madirisha hiyo ndo napika hapo ndani hiyo ndo nalala kitoka nje pia hata hakuna kwa kukimbilia kwa sababu hakuna miti ya kivuli chini pregnant and postpartum women do not drink enough water because the water is contaminated naka unahisi kiu sana maji yetu hata kukunywa pia na hofia sababu afya ya mtoto wangu mwenye kwa tumbo sababu ni chafu sana Many women continue to perform household chores during pregnancy and immediately after birth. Bibi yangu alipojifungua damu ilichukua muda mwingi kukauka kwa sababu ya kazi nyingi ambazo anafanya na pia kwa jua ambalo linawaka huku ni kali. After our research findings, we came back to this community to co-design with community members at different levels so that they can come up with priority interventions. We focus on behavior change interventions to reduce heavy workload. We engage male spouses, mother-in-laws, community health volunteers, religious and local chiefs. We sensitize the community on the health effects of heat and community health volunteers to include danger messages in their daily work. Mothers-in-law and male partners pledge to support women and a public pledge from the chiefs to mobilize communities to support mothers. Itakuwa ni mbaya na sheria itakuwa na kuangalia vibaya sana. Ikiwa wewe usikusaidia huyo mama ambaye uko pale na ananyonyesha. Kwa hivyo uhakikishe kwamba unatekeleza ile majukumu ya kunyumbani, usaidie na yeye naye ajisikie kwa wewe. Ni haki yake. Kupitia hao mafunzo yenye nimepata kwa chuo kikuu cha Aga Khan. Nimebadilika sahihi na nimejua kuwa mama anastahili sana kusaidiwa. Mothers are encouraged to do task shifting and perform heavy duties when it is not hot. Sikuwa najua kuwa kutembea na mtoto wakati wa joto jingi kunaweza leta athari. Lakini tangu nipate haya mafunzo nafanya kazi zangu kwa wakati kama ni asubuhi, alafu nikishamaliza narudi kupumzika sasa. Kulialia kwa sababu ile joto siku na kwa shido unakaa sasa unaanza kum... Okay so the video you've just watched is a video that was developed by the Climate Heat Matano and your Natural Health Consortium which was the first uh, consortium to map up the impact of climate heat on maternal and neonatal health. So we had an, we 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 had research, implementation science research, and then we did a, an intervention that focused on behavior change. So these are some of the lessons uh, we learned uh, from our study. We did learn that uh, uh, we identified key challenges, which included low awareness of heat risks, constraints on women's activities, and the need to show the impact of health. Lessons learned was that the lesson learned emphasized the importance of mainstreaming heat messages into health strategies, implementing, implementing evidence-based interventions while focusing on mothers' needs for food, hydration, and rest, engaging with communities, as well as evaluating the effectiveness of heat-related messages. So what can healthcare workers do? What measures can they take? This need to raise awareness and educate vulnerable groups about the dangers of heat exposure. And this need to implement heat early warning systems to alert communities of impending heat waves. And this need for healthcare workers to promote hydration and cooling measures for at-risk populations in the communities and in the health facilities. Also, Healthcare workers need to take up proactive uh, measures to monitor high risk patients regularly during the heat events, both in the homes, in the facilities. And there's also need for to adapt clinical environments by incorporating cleaning and installing cooling uh, systems. So lastly, there is um, this evidence that healthcare workers may not uh, have enough training on the impact of heat 
and how it affects them, their health, their physical and mental health well-being, as well as how it may be impacting uh, their patients. So with this, this need to train staff to be able to recognize and respond early to heat-related illnesses. So the next one, I'm gonna look at early weather warning and the importance of early weather warning. But I want you to watch this short video and then we look at it. <clears throat> Chamna Harisach has observed that an early weather warning system that can alert pregnant and postpartum mothers about upcoming drought and extreme temperatures could help them and their communities plan to protect themselves from the sweltering heat. The available weather warning information on the radio and television is sometimes inaccurate and many residents do not seek weather information in part because the information is provided in English. Many rural residents in Kilifi depend on indigenous information weather communication strategies passed on from different generations such as rainmakers and observing clouds. <laughs> But as we face uh, this particular session of climate change, we want to revert back to our systems which were very perfect, were quite predictable, and they were very simple. In addition, policymakers and community members emphasized the need to improve the delivery of early weather warning message in local languages, as well as capacity building the community health volunteers, chiefs, and other community leaders to assist in delivering timely messages in schools, churches, mosques, and communities. Okay, so we have talk a bit on heat early weather warning systems. Uh, that video is just an introduction. So what's the role of heat early weather warning system? Um, so heat early weather warning system has a role to provide timely alerts to protect vulnerable populations from extreme weather, to enable preventive actions and to reduce heat, to reduce heat related health risks. So it's important because uh, when people, when communities receive heat early weather warning uh, in advance and take up protective measures, it can reduce heat related illnesses and deaths, especially in high risk groups like pregnant women, children, and the elderly, while also helping them to preserve livelihoods. So as you've seen from the previous video you watched, there are current challenges in Africa. First of all, there's limited access to weather warning systems, uh, as we can see, as we, as we have seen in the previous video, and then there's reliance on indigenous knowledge, uh, weather warning messages, and sometimes they're not accurate. There's gender disparities in information access uh, based on some of the emerging findings from research. And there's lack of localized uh, weather warning information because we know clearly that climate change is impacting communities within their context. You move from 10 kilometers, people are experiencing differently. So early, so heat early weather warning messages need to be localized so that communities can adapt and take preventive measures. Then the issues around language barriers, for instance, as you've seen, uh, communities who've worked in have uh, raised issues about the Department of Metrology delivering these messages in English, where and where we have a large swath of uh, rural communities who don't read, uh, who don't understand English, they end up missing uh, on these uh, messages. So this need also um, um, the other the other infrastructural challenges. But what needs to be done is to strengthen national systems, uh, improve access to diverse channels, and also this need, this opportunity to integrate indigenous knowledge with modern warning uh, systems from the Department of uh, Metrology. And lastly, also to diversify these messages so that they can reach the most uh, vulnerable groups in communities, especially in rural communities where uh, heat is impacting 
uh, the majority of the population. And that is my last slide, call for action on extreme heat. There's need to care for vulnerable groups. There's need to protect workers and there's need to uh, boost resilience. Uh, thank you so much for listening and that's the end of my slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Adeline Dusambili, for your very, very insightful presentations that really highlight the hydrolytic risk during critical pregnancy period, and also for sharing with us these very, very nice videos. Okay, let me maybe move forward to introduce a little bit Dr. Khadija too, and we'll come back to you, Dr. Adeline, during the Q&A section. Uh, Dr. Khadija Kajo, as I said, is uh, she's from uh, the Institute or uh, l'Institut de Recherche en Sciences de la Santé, du Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique et Technologique uh, in Ouagadougou, Burkina. She will be presenting in French. Et elle va présenter un peu sur l'extrême chaleur. So she will make a presentation in uh, French and she will talk about the impact of extreme heat on uh, the well-being of women and uh, newborn in Burkina Faso. So she'll make the presentation in French, but please remember that there is uh, interpretation available into English for those who want to follow in English, but also in Portuguese. So Dr. Cadio, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Please confirm you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Dr. Adelaide for her presentation. We worked a lot together on these issues, and she gave an image that shows us the issues and um, the problems around heat. But I want to present a case study that we conducted in Burkina Faso on extreme heat and uh, the well being of women and uh, newborn. So I will make a presentation around four elements. So I'll give you the Burkina Faso context, and I will also give you some empirical studies. I'll give you some of the results, and then also the lessons learned. So where is Burkina Faso? It is a Sahelian country that is found in West Africa. It is one of the hottest countries in the region, and we have 22 million inhabitants in that country, and the temperature are between 25 degrees and 32 degrees. And uh, between December and January, the minimum temperature is 17 degrees, and the highest temperatures are around 40 degrees or more between March and April. So when it comes to the public health policy, the Burkina Faso has a national policy for climate adaptation that was adopted in 2021, uh, thanks to the Ministry of Environment. However, this uh, policy was very more like a skeleton and was focused on uh, actions against uh, malaria, for example. And in this policy, nothing was mentioned concerning the vulnerable groups, such as the elderly people, the pregnant women, and the newborn and yet in the documentation existing documentation as my colleague just said it these people especially elderly people and pregnant women and newborn uh, babies are extremely vulnerable to extreme temperatures and uh, since we are in a hot country in burkina faso we wanted to analyze the impact of these extreme temperatures on these vulnerable groups which are the pregnant women and the newborn. So our objective was to produce knowledge 
to inform public policy. So our objective was to analyze the impact of exposure to ambient heat during pregnancy, after delivery, and also with the newborns, not just within communities, but also within health centers. And one of the objectives also was after producing this knowledge to formulate uh, interventions and test those interventions to see the results of those interventions. So what I'm presenting to you are the results and lessons learned from all the research activities that we have conducted in Burkina Faso. So we had three types of research, quantitative research, qualitative research, and also um, co-design and implementation of interventions. Uh, the quantitative research activities were about how extreme heat affects breastfeeding practices. The qualitative research activities were about exploring experiences and perceptions of heat uh, with women during pregnancy, childbirth, and on the child, and also the impact of the uh, health services as well as the strategies for adaptation. So the participatory approach was about elaborating an intervention that will be implemented, then tested or evaluated. So we conducted all these uh, research activities with a multidisciplinary team with people who work with uh, in the area of uh, climate change, others in public health, others in epidemiology, and others in uh, social science. And we worked not just in rural areas, but also in urban areas, so as to compare the results. So um, the first result I can give you is what we found out about the impact of heat upon women during their pregnancy and also after giving birth during the postpartum uh, period. We realized that the ambient heat greatly affects the well-being of uh, pregnant women, especially four elements, physical consequences. They are very uh, tired. They are not able to rest and sleep. They are dehydrated. They have some skin problems. And uh, it also has an incidence on their performance. And they are not able to take care of themselves. Social consequences, they have a tendency to isolate themselves. And there's also a disharmony with others within the family that comes as a result of the psychologic, psychological uh, uh, consequences such as the irritability during uh, pregnancy and also the postpartum stress that increases because they are worrying about themselves and their babies and they are anxious. And when they have a baby that cries a lot, often they are not able to pinpoint what exactly is wrong with the baby. Is the baby sick? Is it because of the heat that the baby is uh, agitated? So this increases their irritability and their anxiety and their stress. Concerning the um, economic consequences, when you look at the economic consequences, these women, uh, very often they cannot do their daily activities, which is why uh, many women who are the breadwinner no longer will bring income to the house, and that has an impact on the home. Concerning uh, the newborn, we realized that there were rash, uh, rashes, heat rashes, uh, and boils on the skin. Um, these are these appear after birth, and uh, red bunches of small blisters that blisters that appear at birth, making it difficult to care for newborns. We also notice that heat increases discomfort and affects breastfeeding and sleep, and uh, also the baby may be crying all the time or not be able to sleep or not be able to concentrate on breastfeeding or hold the breast properly. So this can also be explained by the quantitative results in Burkina Faso demonstrated that during the periods of heat, the time of breastfeeding decreases. So there could be a link between 
forgotten this too, which explains why mothers notice that uh, their newborn babies lose weight during uh, the hot weather. As far as um, the healthcare facility environment is concerned, we notice that uh, the hospital rooms after birth, where, where the women are put after birth, they have small windows, so they don't have good ventilation, which means that uh, the facilities are not adapted to deal with heat. And this is even worse in rural areas and in semi-urban areas where there's no electricity, where there's no solar panels to power those health centers, and in which case they would be able to use maybe fans or um, air conditioners. We also noticed that uh, heat affects the relation between uh, the patients and the, uh, the health workers. So women perceive that service is not of adequate quality during these uh, uh, heated periods compared to when the atmosphere or the weather is cooler. And uh, they have a feeling that there are hasty consultations and hasty experiences or rushed consultations. And indeed, the health workers might not spend as much time as needed with them. And also, when you think of the waiting periods in the waiting rooms that are not properly ventilated, and this increases the pressure and the healthcare worker wants to finish his work quickly and go and uh, breathe um, cool air outside. So this creates tension within the healthcare centers. We also realized that what the service providers told us and what the women told us is that when it is hot, women do not really stick to their appointments uh, before giving birth and after giving birth. And the women explained that this is due to the fact that they wake up late because it is in the morning that they are able to sleep a bit, especially during the pregnancy, because during the night it was hot and they couldn't sleep. So since they were able to sleep in the morning, they tried to catch up. And yet the consultations in uh, healthcare centers occur early in the morning. So if they get up late, well, they will not necessarily stick to the appointment time and they will miss appointments, some of the appointments before birth. Our empirical results also highlighted some beliefs, attitudes and practices uh, linked to heat. For instance, some adaptation strategies towards health have harmful consequences. For example, uh, there are women and other community members who believe that in times of extreme heat, um, exclusive breastfeeding could not quench the baby's thirst. It's a belief. They believe that uh, the mother's milk is not enough. And because of that, they give water or some other beverage to the baby because they think that uh, the mother's milk is not enough to quench the baby's thirst. So during this periods of extreme heat, we noticed that uh, that uh, exclusive breastfeeding is not observed. There are also some beliefs that causes women not to drink enough water, even when they are aware that uh, good water, uh, what um, safe drinking water will quench their thirst. There is a belief that drinking water whilst you are pregnant will uh, disturb the growth of the fetus that can even lead to a difficult uh, birth. So some women do not drink as much water, you know, cool water as they should. And yet refraining themselves from drinking cool water will lead them to drinking room temperature water. And they believe that uh, they, they don't drink enough water. They just don't drink enough water. There's also another belief that uh, during the postpartum period, a woman 
who drinks cool water will slow her recovery. So they drink less cool water and more room temperature water, which makes it difficult for them to be properly hydrated. So based on these results, empirical results, we decided to co-develop an intervention with all these people who participated in our research, but also with the community members and uh, healthcare professionals. And the objective of this intervention is to improve the knowledge of women about good practices and strategies to mitigate the effect of heat in their context. And our specific objective was to encourage health professionals to integrate messages about heat in their daily routine activities. Because if they integrate these messages in their daily routine, uh, women will have access to that information and they will be aware on the good attitudes and practices that they have to adopt. So we planned an intervention. We had to identify the messages to change attitudes and practices about heat and maternal and newborn health with regards to health, of course, uh, to heat, sorry. We also developed message-based communication tools we also trained health professionals and community health workers to use those tools and they integrated the messages in their routine activities. And the intervention was implemented over eight months in uh, the training as well as in, um, sensitizing the communities. The tools that we developed were mainly um, image boxes, we made drawings, that show how women in communities can behave so as to reduce the impact of heat on women and children. We also conceived some uh, videos, short videos that were shared on WhatsApp groups in the community to reach people on their phones to give them advice on uh, how they can behave when there is a heat wave. We also disseminated those short videos in waiting rooms within dispensaries and maternity wards. This is, of course, in urban uh, areas because in rural areas, it was not possible to use these tools. How much time am I left with? Am I able to show maybe one more thing? Yes, please go ahead. We still have some time, please. Okay. So you can go ahead. So I'm going to share the tools that we developed. Uh, confirm you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. So these are the tools that we developed. We call them... Uh, image boxes. These are messages that health professionals can uh, use during their trainings and uh, during their interaction with women to show them the consequences of uh, drinking more cool water and uh, also explain why at times it seems like breastfeeding seems not to be enough and explain to them that research demonstrates that uh, the mother's milk is enough, they should continue breastfeeding their newborn baby. You see images like this one, so as to insist on the importance of uh, breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding, even when it is hot. And uh, we also created images to show them that women can drink water, whether it is cool water, warm water, or room temperature, uh, water, it doesn't have an impact on the fetus or on the recovery of the woman. This was an attempt to unbuild these false beliefs, such as, uh, well, uh, during such and such a period when the baby is still in the womb, we shouldn't drink this kind of water. So these are the tools that we developed 
You can have a look at the various images. And we also developed short videos. I don't have enough time to show you the various videos, but uh, I gave you a link so you can go and have a look at them. Thank you so much. I would like to now present the lessons learned. It's just one slide and I'll be done. Please go ahead. Uh, confirm you can see my slides. Yes, if you can display in full screen. So what are the lessons learned from all these processes? It's that uh, pregnant and postpartum women have little awareness of the health risks of exposure to extreme heat because it's quite hot in those areas. And for those women, they say, well, it's normal. But the health risks on them and the babies, uh, whether it is still in the womb or it's born, the, there's not enough awareness. And we realized that, uh, that the health professionals did not have a great awareness of these risks because it is not integrated in the various health policies, it is not incorporated in their training as health professionals. So we believe that it is necessary to set up a strategy to adapt the health system to climate change by developing programs and policies. Uh, for example, you can uh, enhance ongoing uh, training and also readjust the existing curriculum so that it can have a positive impact on the practices of the health professionals. Also do capacity development with uh, the health workers in terms of communication with uh, the women, specifically concerning health risks related to heat and also let them know uh, the adaptation strategies when it comes to primary health care. So these are possible tools that will strengthen the resilience of our health system, considering the climate change effects that are not getting better anytime soon. And this also gives you a glimpse of the partners who shouldered us in this work. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadjo for this wonderful presentation. It's uh, full of examples, illustrations. So I was saying thank you so much, Dr. Kadjo, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it, has, it is quite illustra illustrative. And also thank you for sharing your examples in urban areas and in um, rural areas. I believe that this is a beautiful case that gives us information, especially to uh, health professionals who have, who have joined us here. And thank you also for sharing the tools that you are using uh, with us. Now, there are some people who say that uh, there's a language barrier every now and then because interpretation <laughs> is not exactly as they would have expected. Uh, translation is, is not working. We, we are very sorry for that. But we'll share all the materials. The presentation, we have both French and English version and even Portuguese version that will be shared <laughs> with you. And we'll also share the recording for you. I think now with this, we can move to the q and section. If you, uh, we see that some people are adding their uh, questions there. If you have any question for the presenter, please go to the QNN uh, sections and add your, your, your question. Uh, we have some question for Dr. Adeline Lusambili and also some question for Dr. Kajo. I will start with the question for Dr. Adeline. Uh, we have first question I think comes for, from Stefan. I'm sorry if I 
did not pronounce well your 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 name, Stefan. Me, he said, what explains the variability in temperature rise across the different region of Africa? And the second question comes from Miss Ganau Tewacho. So, saying that how do we measure the heat as a risk factor for morbidity and mortality in health facility? in healthcare facility and also in outdoor. I would just give you maybe five questions so you can try to respond on that so we can have another, we can have another next round questions. Uh, did you got what I said or you would like me to repeat the question? Dr. Adeline. Yes, I got the, the one for heat uh, measurements in the facilities and then the uh, the temperature measurements across Africa. Okay, let me repeat the third one. How can we strengthen our health system to be able to catch more children? And is there a correlation between heat-related stress and mitigation uh, strategy in Africa? And what lesson can we learn from this in terms of resilience and adaptation to extreme heat conditions? Maybe you can try to respond to that question first. So I can ask, yeah. Okay, so let me uh, try to answer the one for the uh, the heat uh, threshold, how it's uh, it's made. Um, I am not uh, actually. I'm a social scientist, medical anthropologist, but I'll try to answer that question the way I understand it. So, when we talk about heat stress and uh, the heat uh, threshold, for instance, it, it takes different measurement. If, for instance, um, you are in uh, you're working. Uh, in uh, in an environment that has 28 to 30 degrees for a continuous uh, period of time, it's considered to be um, on the upper limit. So if, for instance, you work in one place that has 28 to 30 degrees centigrade of heat exposure, that's on the upper limit. And if you're working below 23 degrees uh, uh, centigrade, that's the lower limit. So if the exposure is how many days you work or you are exposed to extreme heat. But there's a way scientists that work in this area to that kind of math. And that's not actually my area, but I know exposure depends on how long maybe a newborn is exposed to certain temperatures. And then that's how they will impact the health. So the question on temperature and health facilities, uh, that's a new, you know, clearly climate change is really new uh, in the content, continent. And we are trying to get data that could inform some of these things. Like one of the studies I am doing right now is to measure temperatures in the health facilities to find out which exposure has the highest intensity on the chart, measuring both the clinical facility temperatures and outside and we're trying to do modeling so that we can come up with the question somebody asked on temperature uh, in the health facilities and exposure. So I don't actually have answers for that now, but we have a study we are uh, conducting now at present that may answer some of these questions. And then the other one on how to strengthen health system heat mitigation uh, strategy. And again, there's a lot of uh, research that's now going on uh, in our continent. I know there is, I am I am cognizant that there's lack of funding, but there's parts of research that is going on that can inform this. Otherwise, what is happening now is um, we don't have data, to be honest. There's no much data in the continent, but there's work going on that could actually inform this isn't it on health strengthening as it relates to heat, medication and adaptability. Um, that's it from my end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Adele. And maybe we, we have some, yeah, some lot of question for you. Uh, maybe let me add two question for you again before I go to Dr. Khadija too, so we can come back because I think we still have 25 minutes left before 
we do the evaluation and this is session so we can respond as much as we can for some questions. Uh, There's also Raquel Gidi who asks, are there any extreme heat emergency measures in place for access to safe and uh, safe water, especially for, for pregnant women, elderly and young children? And can the high number of maternal death be linked to climate change? This is a bit. Yeah, we observe a high number of maternal deaths in one region of Senegal during the month of March, April, May, June, and September. Yeah, I think this is something, yeah, you can maybe respond to the first one because uh, she gives this exa example, I think it's from Senegal. The third question I wanted maybe to ask before go to Khadija too, is what was the intervention implemented? And what was the content of the awareness engagement? Okay, so I, the first question, I didn't really get it, but I can answer the second one, where, where there's a question asking whether there's maternal mortality linked to um, extreme heat. You know, from the statistics I, pre I presented, some modeling has been done. And that's how those statistics came up that is likely in South Africa and in Kenya, in Africa, across a certain number of kids died. And in the UK, from the UK Observatory, actually, there's evidence uh, that shows that uh, heat has an impact on maternal mortality. And from the video I presented, um, that was ethnography, but we are also in now to measure the, the study we are working on. But from the ethnographic data, we had reports that when it's too hot, there's more deaths at, uh, at birth because women become dehydrated and it's very hard to push. Or sometimes the, the birthing method is compromised and there's miscarriage, there's still birth and all that. So ethnographically, uh, communities are linking increasing temperature to that, but this has not been measured. And that's the study we're doing now to see to what extent does heat actually lead to maternal mortality. We're doing that now, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lusambili for your response. Let me just maybe ask some question for Dr. Khadija too. Uh, we have here some questions. The first one is, um, Bon, je vais vous poser les questions en français, donc vous pouvez mm -hmm. répondre en français et on a la traduction. Mm -hmm. Quels sont les efforts déployés par le continent africain pour atténuer les maladies? What is Africa doing to mitigate illnesses linked to heat? That's the first question. The other question is after research revealing the importance or impact of extreme heat on maternal and infant health, what can be done? to help mothers adapt to extreme heat. Would you like to answer these two questions and I will add other questions? Yes, please. For these two questions, the first question, what has the continent, what can the continent do? In my view, this is what we are trying to do currently, not only to produce knowledge, empirical data to show that this is real, that show the impact of these extreme heats on the vulnerable populations, because what is visible at the moment, it is uh, floods, for example. But people are not really aware of extreme heat. So with this knowledge produced, what governments can do is to produce adaptation policies to climate change not just uh, at the level of the health system, but also the health facilities, build more health in, uh, facilities and using building materials that are more appropriate, appropriate, work together with architects for so doing, and also not just the building materials, but also the, the, the shape of the buildings, but also communicate a lot so as to induce a change of behavior so as to remove the inhibiting beliefs these false beliefs such as if you drink warm water 
uh, your baby in your womb will grow fat. So there must be strategies that will help to mitigate these. Now, the second question, please remind me the second question. What was it about? The second question was, what can we do so that mothers can adapt to extreme heat? I think I had started answering that question. We can insist on communication. Really, uh, we have to put an emphasis on communication to bring about a change of behavior. And uh, we have to work on the environment, plant more trees, build with uh, appropriate building materials, but mostly, mostly on communication so that the women can become more aware of this problem, but provide them also with tools that they can use. Because even if they are aware or they are informed, they might not be able to know how should they behave themselves during uh, those uh, heat waves. So they need to be taught also on the appropriate behaviors that have been tested and proven through research. So there's ongoing research and in the years to come, we are sure that we will have uh, efficient communication strategies for them. So there's also a question from Aminata Traore. She's asking, how can we adapt the service delivery during periods of extreme heat? And also, she would like to know whether you observe differences in the heat impact in the rural areas and in the urban areas, because you did studies in the urban areas and the uh, rural areas. Did you notice differences of the impact level when it comes to extreme heat? Well, the difference is what we observed is that uh, facilities in urban areas are uh, they are better, better built uh, than in rural areas. For example, when you look at the maternity ward, I'm not saying it's everywhere, but on the sites that we studied, the ward, the maternity ward have air conditioning. So that air conditioning makes it more agreeable to be there rather than in some other areas uh, that are semi urban or rural areas. So in uh, some other urban areas, you have air that is available, they can be ventilated, but they have small windows, just like what we see in urban, uh, in rural areas where you don't even have fans. And so many women complained that they felt choked because of the heat, unlike in the urban areas that we studied. So most of them had uh, air conditioning in the maternity ward and also in the various bedrooms were also ventilated properly. So these are some of the differences we observed, which somewhat mitigate the effect of heat within uh, health facilities. However, in uh, houses, in urban areas, it is even hotter. Why? Because many houses have iron sheets as their roofs. And also you have houses where you have many more people than they should house, which increases also the effect of uh, heat in urban areas. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cardio few more questions to Dr. Lusambili uh, from, the, from the audience. Mm -hmm. I think there was one question that is, uh, was about uh, awareness engagement. What was the intervention implemented and what was the content of the awareness engagement? If you can maybe respond on that. And let me add another one. Mm -hmm. And there was another question also 
but was looking on where is the balance between providing quality health care to vulnerable people during heat wave due to a lack of climate resilient infrastructure and addressing the strength on health care workers whose mental health is impacted by the same extreme event. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sokna, for, uh, and for raising those questions. So I will attempt to under, I will under the first question and I will attempt to under the second question. So the, our intervention was a behavior change intervention using a system uh, thinking approach to mobilize the community so that they can assist uh, uh, pregnant and postpartum women. And it was also to improve uh, increase knowledge, to create knowledge awareness in the community on the dangers of heat, and as well as to uh, encourage communities to shift some of the harmful social cultural practices that are really harmful to mothers during pregnancy and postpartum that we felt that were endangering women uh, during periods of heat, for instance, when where we had conducted our research, we did find that there were some uh, culturally ingrained harmful, um, harmful practices whereby a child, even in the heat, moms covered a child with a lot of clothes for fear of witchcraft, and we thought, and then these babies actually, when we're doing research, ended up dying. But we knew clearly it was because of those harmful uh, uh, behaviors, you know, that um, that endangered the children. And then another thing, some of the harmful uh, social cultural practices that we wanted to shift were, for instance, moms in one some of the communities where we had done research believed that if they drank water, um, the baby was going to die. The water was going to make the baby in the womb not move and the baby would die or if they drink water immediately after birth, um, it freezes the breast milk or those were belief systems in some communities. So partly we wanted to change that, but we also wanted to shift practices around heavy workload for moms during pregnancy and postpartum because you saw from the videos that they continued to do heavy workload during immediately after birth and after the last uh, day of delivery. And that actually had a negative outcome during birth or immediately after birth. And so we did a code design. There were so many, we had almost 15 different kinds of behavior change we wanted the community to change, but we co-designed with them. We did an evaluation after uh, three, four months. That was the meaning of inter in interventions, but we haven't gone back. That was one and a half years back, and we haven't gone back to do another interventions. We're still looking for funding. Unless any of you has funding, we can go back and see what kind of behaviors have shifted. Uh, thank you very much for that question. And, uh, and the, the one for... Uh, Quality of care. I'm not sure I understood the question, to be honest. Mm -hmm. The second question I asked I'm it. I'm not sure I understand it. Yeah. Um, there's a question that is asked it is, uh, um, it was asking about where if the, there is a balance between providing quality health care to vulnerable group during during heat wave due to lack of climate resilience infrastructure. And in terms of addressing the strength on healthcare workers whose mental health is also affected by the, ex same, the same extreme event. It is a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's not clear, but what I know is that- um, let, me just, let me just to explain for based on my understanding and the flowing, mm -hmm. That's the double burden of inadequate in in uh, climate resilient health system, weight more on vulnerable people or healthcare workers themselves. On both. It's on both. It's on both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's on okay. both, but we don't have evidence, but from observation, it's both. Yeah, they're impacted, mm -hmm. both healthcare workers and the patient that impacted. Yeah. Okay. So means we need more evidence to be able yeah, to yeah, clearly yeah. explain this one. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Adeline, for your for your response. Let thank me you. check and maybe try to have some more questions for Dr. Kaju. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, il uh, y a une question qui mm -hmm. demande, est-ce qu'il y a des... Um, there's a, there's a question. question. There's also sensitization for the people who pollute in Africa. And uh, there are solutions for them. There's another question. Should we fear a desertification of Africa because of these extreme heats? Should we fear desertification in Africa? And also, can we contribute to mitigate the effects of uh, extreme heat? So if we multiply the number of captors, can that contribute to mitigate the, the effects or the risks to extreme heat? I, I think you understand the questions. Yes, I think I do. For the questions concerning uh, the heat captors i think it is uh the the climate uh, sector they are the ones who collect the information on heat and then they relay the information saying to us that uh, in the days to come it's going to be hotter than usual and that uh, you need to apply the appropriate measures, it can help, but mm -hmm. it depends on the context. It depends on the context because these meteorological informations in urban areas, they can be accessed by the majority of the people who live there, but in uh, rural areas, it's quite difficult. So I cannot say yes or no. I'm saying it could contribute to that, but it depends on the context. As far as uh, our issue is concerned, concerning training, you know, health trainings, as well as uh, the health facilities, what is important is that in the near future, it's better to rethink how do we build our health facilities can we rethink the architecture of these health facilities? What kind of building materials should be used? Uh, health materials that better absorb heat so that even if there's no electricity and there's no air conditioning, people can be inside those uh, health facilities without being affected by heat too much. So these are things that have to be incorporated in our strategies. But also the other thing is to plant as many trees as possible, reforestation in our uh, estates where we live, plant trees around us. This will definitely contribute to mitigate the effects of uh, extreme heat. So globally speaking, that's what I could say to to these questions based on the research and studies that we have conducted yes i think you we still have thank you we thank you seven minutes uh, let me maybe ask one more question to each of you that's fine so we can use the uh, maybe five last minute to talk about the evaluation that's fine for you to have each one more question Go ahead, thank you. Yes, uh, maybe let me continue with um, Dr. Kajo. Uh, just a follow up about uh, la sensibilisation mm -hmm. pour, pour lire, quand même. Concerning uh, sensitization, souvent, engaging the, those who pollute, those who pollute Africa, those who are responsible for these great nocive emissions. What has been done so far, apart from engaging the health professionals, but the sectors that are uh, guilty of pollution, even though that uh, Africa uh, doesn't pollute that much. Okay, in our strategy, 
we integrated the strategic level before we go to the training and community engagement we incorporated the strategic uh, aspect uh, people from the ministry of health ministry of environment uh, the um, climate services, the NGOs that work in uh, the climate change sector, even reporters, journalists, who can also be associated to disseminate the message so as to see how can we fashion the right interventions. And together we exchanged, how can we deal with these problems? How can we come up with an appropriate uh, intervention? So this was the strategic level. Then we went to the community level and worked there, but also we went to the intermediary level with the health system. So it is the overall results that we drew with these various actors or stakeholders that we were able to develop an intervention that aims at inform at this point in time inform because we realized that uh, many people were not aware of the risks so we were wondering what can we do right now with the limited resources that we have right now in our research so we can start by informing people so that they are aware of the problem and also how can we help women to adopt the, the behaviors that will be a, an adaptation measure for climate uh, for uh, extreme heat because we know that it is good to communicate with the hope that people will change their behavior but that change of behavior will not happen overnight so we need to come up with tools to train healthcare professionals so that they can internalize that and when they are dealing with a pregnant uh, woman, we can, they can immediately ask them, how much water do you drink? Do you know that it can have an impact on the development of your fetus and encourage them to drink enough water? You can drink cool water, you can drink warm water. Uh, it will not cause your, your fetus to grow abnormally. These are things that we introduced in the health training. So with these two types of research, we were convinced that we will be able to scale up when we now come up with a national policy. Because as soon as, I mean, as long as it is not integrated in the national policy strategy, there will be no change. So we need to integrate it at this level and that we revisit the training curriculum for healthcare professionals so that they are aware of this problem and they will start dealing with that and communicate with the women on the ground. So this is uh, our, our, our view. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cadio, for this uh, answer. What local approach and messages can be passed to communities to combat extreme temperature? I think this is your last question. Oh, so um, you uh, messi messages can really. So I, I, I think it's a broad question. Messages can be uh, segmented to different population and different people at different stages. So for instance, we could have segmented messages for the most vulnerable, uh, like pregnant postpartum women, messages around hydration, as you've seen in our videos, uh, messages about taking preventative measures, messages about harmful behaviors could also be uh, disseminated. And then the whole community, we have messages on early, when owning, uh, early weather warning, when how to take preventive measurements and how to do it in the communities. We will have messages about the built environment because it's a big problem and it's actually where in the, in the homes is where women are likely to suffer from the effects of heat. Maybe that would be at policy level, maybe adjusting the built environment to adapt to the changing weather, isn't it? And then the messages about early weather warnings. There's so many different messages that could be uh, communicated to the communities. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be then medication, cleaning the environment, mm -hmm. uh, taking refugee, yeah. task shifting. Mm -hmm. It's a wide range of messages. Mm -hmm. different. Thank you so much, Dr. Lusambili. I think with this, we I think we are at the end of the session. And thanks again to you and Dr. Kajo for your very, very informative 
presentation and response. Uh, at this point, I want to just go to the next part of the session and invite you participants to evaluate the session. You can use the link that is shared in the chat or scan the QR code with your phone to really respond to really evaluate this session. And also be prepared to take exam. Do, do not forget that, to be able to have your certificate. <laughs> Thank you so much to all. I hope the link is shared and the code. Ale, let me check the chat. Yeah, please evaluate the coach. This is very important. And thank you very much, everyone, for, for really joining this course today's session. Thanks again, Dr. Adeline, and thanks, Dr. Khadija, too. Thank you to you all. Bye.